Fala pessoal, tudo bem por aí? Bem-vindos ao nosso primeiro episódio bônus. Eu sou o Guilherme Seabra, Head de Produto e Design na Isinvest, e o nosso convidado de hoje é Marty Kagan. Pois é, ele mesmo. Para quem não ouviu os nossos episódios anteriores, o Produto Pelo Mundo é o podcast que entrevista brasileiros que estão desenvolvendo produtos digitais mundo afora. Os episódios bônus, começando por esse, vão fugir um pouco a regra, mas não deixa de ouvir e compartilhar os episódios anteriores. É uma honra ter o Kagan como convidado e a gente acredita que trocas como essa só reforçam ainda mais a comunidade brasileira de produto. Eu chutaria que 99% das pessoas que trabalham com produto digital já conhecem o Kagan, mas não custa nada relembrar rapidamente a sua trajetória. Kagan começou sua carreira como desenvolvedor na HP e passou a se interessar por desenvolvimento de produto de forma mais ampla. Foi lá que ele recebeu o coaching de um líder de produto, depois passou pela Netscape e também foi VP de produto e design no eBay. Ele fundou a Silicon Valley Product Group, que aliás vale muito acessar por todos os conteúdos que eles têm por lá. O Kagan é uma lenda de Product Management no mundo, seu livro Inspired é obrigatório pra gente, e em breve vai chegar a versão em português. No final do ano ele lança o seu novo livro e comenta com a gente um pouco aqui no final do nosso episódio. Além de tudo isso, ainda nessa conversa a gente decidiu então abordar várias questões diferentes, mas todas elas conectadas pelo aspecto de uma cultura de produto. Então ele nos conta sobre times com diversidade cultural, depois a gente fala um pouco sobre as diferenças de um PM para um PO, liderança de produtos, o que significa ser um Empowered Engineer, e fechando com uma recomendação de livro que ele tenha gostado recentemente. Antes de começar, eu quero lembrar da nossa parceria com a Tera, então não deixa de entrar no somostera.com e escolher entre o curso de liderança em produto, UX, Data Science, Marketing Digital ou qualquer outro usando o nosso código com 10% de desconto que vale até o final de julho. O código é PRODUTO PELO MUNDO, tudo junto, e os cursos valem muito a pena. Então vamos para o episódio, todas as respostas do Kagan estão em inglês, mas nos próximos dias a gente vai deixar a opção com legenda para quem preferir no nosso canal do YouTube, que é PRODUTO PELO MUNDO. Quem preferir pode alterar a velocidade do podcast pelo próprio tocador, isso também pode ajudar. Não dá para começar sem agradecer ao Kagan por participar do PRODUTO PELO MUNDO. Sure, thanks for inviting me. Boa, agora sim. Então, a primeira pergunta que a gente fez foi bem ligada ao contexto dos nossos convidados aqui do podcast. A gente perguntou quais são as vantagens de montar times com pessoas de múltiplos países com diversidade cultural. First of all, one of the things we've learned is that when you're trying to innovate, when you're trying to solve hard problems in new and better ways, The more differences you have on your team, the better. Uh, just like I wouldn't want, uh, I wouldn't want one team from just one little part of the world, one kind of person. We like teams of a mixture. We want different everything, different ways people think about problems, different cultures, different uh, educations different problem solving approaches. These are the more differences actually the better. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence behind that too. This is really important. And one of the things I always thought was special about Silicon Valley, and by the way, this is not true in most of the United States, but in Silicon Valley, a typical product team has people from, from China, from Russia, from Korea, from Mexico, from Brazil, from everywhere. Uh, it's it's normal, and I think that is part of its uh, what makes it special. And I encourage companies all over the world to try to get more um, more women on their teams, more minorities on their team, more just more uh, different life experiences. Now, um, I've also been a big fan. You know, for a long time in the tech industry. Basically, all the products were invented in the U.S. and then just shipped to other parts of the world. And, and they were told, you know, this is it. You want to run it? Fine. Uh, and I have always won, with the exception of, you know, that every once in a while, a company in the U.S. would have some engineers outsourced at another country. They might be in Brazil. They might be in Israel. They might be in China. And... 
but I think the real potential is actually to create c- products for those other countries by people in those other countries. So when I first started going to Brazil, which was, which was quite a while ago now, about almost 15 years ago, do you remember the company LocoWeb? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, LocoWeb was really one of the first internet companies. Uh, of course, they were providing infrastructure like internet access, but they were a perfect time to do that in Brazil. And I was encouraging, though, that, that LocoWeb build products for Brazilians. Uh, that's a really powerful concept. And and I think they did, and many other companies did. Of course, today there's many good companies in Brazil doing products for Brazil. And by the way, increasingly, company, con- they're doing products for the rest of the world, uh, which is really the ultimate sign of success, where you could be anywhere in the world and produce products for anywhere in the world. So, um, That's really leveraging, because you really know your customers better. Legal. Aqui no Brasil a gente tem oportunidade para aumentar a nossa diversidade em vários quesitos. Mas eu também quis saber quais são os maiores desafios que ele vê em times assim. The benefits usually far outweigh the costs. The challenges, there are challenges always, of course. The challenges are when your product team is not located where your customers are. So if we are a product team in uh, Sao Paulo and we want to build a product, however, for a team in Berlin, that's harder because we have a law, you know, I mean, we have video conferencing and things like that, but between time zone and language and culture differences, is harder. Um, We can overcome all of these things. It's none of them are fatal, but they all make it harder. And so we have to work harder around that. We have to communicate more. We have to do more video instead of phone and email and Slack and things like that. Depois dessa pergunta de aquecimento, vamos para um tema mais quente. Fiz três perguntas que giram em torno de product owners e product managers. Eu começo questionando se ele vê problemas na quantidade de pessoas que trocam seus títulos no LinkedIn de PO para PM sem entender a real diferença entre os dois papéis. Well, mostly that's a good thing that they're changing their title. Um, product owner is a ridiculous title to put on a LinkedIn profile. And I tell people all the time, if they tell me they're a product owner, I'm like, really? Are you just a product owner? Your company pays you to be a product owner when they, what they really need is a product manager? And so most people confuse, uh, or many people confuse, they, they, the job of a product manager includes the responsibilities on an agile team of a product owner. But just a product owner is just a backlog administrator. So what I hope you are seeing is that many people have come to understand this. They've gone to a product owner class and they know what it means to a product owner, but now they know that it's ridiculous to call themselves a product owner. That is much too small of a responsibility that what they really are is they need to learn how to be a product manager, which includes the product owner responsibilities. So that's what I hope you are seeing. Um, I know that not every case, that's the way. In, I've met some countries in the world, and I really think this is because of the translation from English. They think normally product manager is here and product owner is just down here. But they think it's the other way around. They think that a product owner is a bigger job than a product manager, which of course is, is not true. Boa. E será que ele vê impactos nas empresas? Será que elas mesmas deixam de refletir se o que elas têm são POs ou PMs? Well, and that's a real problem. It doesn't, the way it usually shows up is that in their old company, before they moved to Agile, before they did anything about product, they didn't have product owners or product managers. 
the, in those companies, they had business analysts, BAs, or sometimes just project managers. And those people were uh, given a, you know, a new job when they moved to Agile. And so many people just retitled those, many companies just retitled those people. And that's a very dangerous problem because um, it's a very different job. To go from a business analyst in an IT organization to a product manager in a technology powered company is a very different job. O Kagan já escreveu diversas vezes sobre as diferenças, mas não dava para deixar de perguntar. Então, vamos com a visão dele do que é um PO e um PM. Well, the product owner is just the administrator of the backlog. There are some responsibilities on an agile team, assuming they're using Scrum or Kanban or some process like that. There are some responsibilities that they have. And so, That is a, a subset of the responsibilities of a product manager. It's usually about 5% of the job. It's not a big part of the job. Um, but everybody has this. Developers, if you talk to any engineer writing software, they'll complain to you about how much time they have to spend in JIRA updating tickets. And it's the same thing. The product manager has to do that. The designer has to do that. They all, we all have these administrative responsibilities, but that's not just like saying, is it, you would never go to an engineer and say, Oh, you know how to use Jira. So you must be an engineer. No, right. That's ridiculous. So uh, it's the same thing. The product owner is just the responsibilities on an agile team. So the real question is, On a product team, we need engineers, real engineers, we need designer, and we need a product manager. All three of those roles have very different contributions, just very different contributions. But for a typical product, we need all three. Um, and so we know what the designers do generally, we know what engineers do generally, but there's a lot of confusion about what product managers do. And uh, the product manager, The first thing we should be clear, I'm talking about real product teams at good product companies. Because in a lot of companies, they, uh, they still have people called product managers, but they're what we call feature teams. They are just, uh, you know, they're really project managers is what they are with a fancy title. But you're asking, I think, about real product teams. The kind of people that do, whether it's an iPhone or an Alexa device or AWS or Spotify or any of your favorite true technology-powered products and services, those, uh, those do require real product manager. And uh, the designer is responsible for making sure the solution is usable and the engineers are responsible for making sure the solution is feasible. We can build it. But the product manager is responsible for making sure the solution is valuable, people will buy it, and viable. It works for our business, legally, marketing, sales, privacy, security, ethical constraints, all of those constraints. So, and that, that's really what the product manager's responsibility is. And it is a very hard job. To be responsible for value and viability is a full-time job, for sure. Muito bom. Para quem quiser se aprofundar na descrição do episódio, a gente deixa um artigo em que ele detalha ainda mais sobre o assunto. Vamos para o próximo tópico, que é tema comum dentro da comunidade de produto. Falamos sobre uma cultura de comando e controle e se existe alguma linha que, quando cruzada, coloca em risco toda uma cultura de produto da empresa quando o top management interfere sem embasamento em dados e com grande foco em output e não em outcomes. Ah, oh, well, that's a very complicated question. <laughs> Because what we're really talking about is, you know, the culture of your company and and leader, the role of the leaders. Um, and, you know, you, first of all, I should say that every product person has to be smart about this. They have to pick their battles. So I have met product managers that anytime a leader says, hey, I think we should build this, they get all upset. 
and they say you cross the line and you know you're a terrible ceo and a terrible human being <laughs> and and you know what happens they usually are looking for a job pretty soon <laughs> So I try to, you know, they really have to pick their battles. And I also point out to them, I say, look, I've worked for CEOs that are very hands off. They're like, this is your responsibility. As long as you solve it, I'm fine. And I've also worked with CEOs that absolutely love every detail of product. And really, they used to be great product people, and they still want to contribute in product. And they are very hands on. In my opinion, it's better to have the CEO that's very hands-on, that wants to. And now we have to give those CEOs a way to work with us that's constructive, useful. So rather than what we don't really want them doing is coming in, you know, every Monday and saying, this is what I want you to build this week, and I'll be back on Friday to see it. <laughs> that's not really what we're looking for. But if they stop by even every day and say, hey, I, did you see this article? Did you see this product that was just done? Uh, what do you think? Do you think we should try that idea? I'd love to see us try that idea. And if the next day or two days later, the product manager says, hey, come look at this prototype. We're trying out that idea. And it either works and we're like, this is awesome, or it doesn't work and we're like, wow, good thing we only built a prototype instead of building a product. So it's really about creating that culture where product teams and the executive teams really understand the real contributions of each other and they work together to solve these problems rather than, you know, command and control. Eu confesso que eu gostei muito da resposta do Keegan, até porque eu acredito muito que a gente tem várias formas de criar um ambiente e uma cultura cada vez mais forte em produtos. Mas vamos manter o nosso foco na alta liderança. Eu comentei com ele que no Brasil ainda temos poucos líderes de produto no C-level das empresas. E perguntei qual a importância ele vê em uma liderança ainda mais forte em produtos. Over the last two years, This, what you just asked is what I think is the most important problem of all the problems in technology, because it's not just Brazil, by the way, it's all over the world. We have a huge shortage of strong product leaders, a very big shortage. You have some great ones. I actually know some there. And, uh, you, and there are great ones in San Francisco, in New York, in Berlin, all over the world. But there are many more that have no idea what they're doing. Right. So this, I think, is the biggest problem. And the reason I say it's the biggest problem is because if the leaders don't know what they're doing, there's no way for their teams to be successful. So we really have to get those teams uh, coached by good leaders. So my focus for the last two years and going forward is is the leaders. In fact, I um, just finished uh, another book. And that book is, uh, it's, it's not going to, it's the publisher has it. It'll be a few months until it's out on shelves. But that book is aimed at leaders. It's meant to answer that question. And, um, and I had leaders that I know and respect from all over the world review that book. And I wanted to make sure it covered the things that really need to be covered because it's a very hard problem uh, to give the leaders all the knowledge they need. And um, I'm ex that's what I'm really hoping is the way we answer that question is we get many more leaders educated about how to be a good product leader. Muito bem, hora de falar sobre engenheiros e desenvolvedores. Esse tema não é novo nos artigos e apresentações do Keegan e eu pedi para ele explicar o que significa ser um empowered engineer. The most important thing if you want a good product team is to have empowered engineers. Now, it is also true that not every engineer cares about being empowered. But here's the thing, that is much less common than people think it is. It is, I do know some, so it is real, but it's quite rare. Most of the time, 
when up, you know, I'm told by a product manager or a vice president director of product that the engineers don't want to do this. And so I always say, I want to talk to the engineers myself. And most of the time, the engineers say that's totally not true. And in fact, their biggest complaint is when they're not included. To, and because now they have to clean up the mess that's generated when they weren't consultant with, consulted when they should have been. Now, what's really going on in those companies is a product manager or product leader that thinks that every minute of a developer's time should be spent coding. And they don't understand the importance of them inventing and not just delivering. And that is, um, so most of the time that's what it takes. Sometimes though, the, the engineers tell me, you know, we don't really care. Just tell us what to build. And then I ask them, the next question I ask them is, when's the last time you actually visited a customer? And most of the time, the answer, by the way, is never. At best, months ago. And I say, okay, you need to go to a customer, like right away. Because that is the best way to get engineers motivated. Because when they see people struggling with their products and unhappy, they take it personally. And they are very motivated to fix it. You can usually not stop them. And what they start doing is stop, they stop trusting a product manager to tell them what to build because they realize that that doesn't usually work. And instead, they get interested in seeing the customer issues themselves, which changes that mindset. And like I said, once in a while though, that's not it, they just don't wanna do it, which is fine, because unlike product manager and designer, we have somewhere between two and 10 engineers on a product team. And all we need is one that is a senior tech lead, like we're talking about, that cares about customers. And as long as we have that, we can do a great product. If we don't have even one, then what I usually have to do is sit down with the head of engineering, which by the way is all too often in those kinds of companies called a CIO, Chief Information Officer. Mm -hmm. and try to explain to them that they have amateurs working for them and that what they really need to do is hire some professionals and raise their game. And that's really the difference between a vice president of engineering and a CIO. Recentemente o Kagan postou que o seu livro Inspired é para product managers e times de produto e que Empowered vai ser para líderes de produto. Eu perguntei o que ele podia revelar para os nossos ouvintes sobre o novo livro que vai ser lançado em dezembro. Well, I can reveal a lot because uh, the book is not coming out till December. However, for the last two years, I have been writing articles which were meant to become chapters in this book. And there are over a hundred of them on the website. So the way I like to work is to use the same principles in product for the book when I have a concept that I think is important, like product strategy or OKRs for product teams or coaching product managers, any topic that I think is important. I write an article, which is really an MVP of a chapter of a book, hopefully. If it's good, it will become a chapter in a book. If it's bad, it will just stay on the website or I might delete it. Uh, and so then I publish that article. And usually I tell people on Twitter and LinkedIn that there is an article on this topic if you want to read it. And many people read it and I get questions and I get feedback. And I'm able to learn what really works and what doesn't work, and what is convincing, and what's not convincing. And, and then I iterate on that, and then that goes into the book. And that's how I've written all my books, is that process. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of iteration, <laughs> a lot of prototyping. These articles are essentially a prototype for a chapter. And 
I also don't want anybody, I mean, books are not that expensive, but there are people in the world that really can't even afford a book. And I would like them to be able to have access. So if, as long as they have access to the internet, they can get access to this content. So, so you'll see if you go look at the last two years worth of articles, there were many topics, all of which were focused on leaders. I talk a lot about coaching because that's the biggest responsibility. Talk a lot about staffing, how you hire and develop and, and uh, interview people. And then uh, a lot about product vision, product strategy, product objectives, um, and uh, also about a difficult topic, which is the sort of, you started at it when you talked about the executives uh, working with a CEO, which is this, uh, how do you really transform a culture? That's another big topic. All of those are covered. I mean, the book is a large book. It came out over 400 pages because there's a lot of topics. Quem acompanha os artigos que o Kagan escreve sabe que alguns deles geram polêmicas e deixam algumas pessoas descontentes. Foi assim quando ele escreveu sobre a diferença entre Product Teams e Feature Teams. Eu quero saber que tipo de feedback ele recebe nesses casos mais polêmicos. Well, um, I mean, the, the, I was surprised at how much feedback I got on that one, because I felt like I had been talking about that topic for many years. But, you know, part of writing and speaking is finding the right words. And I didn't expect the response, but once I published that, many, many more people finally understood what I was trying to say. And so it resonated. In fact, that was one of the articles that, that made me decide I needed to write this book. Um, but that it sort of found the right words because what I think was going on is many people were essentially feature teams, but they thought they were product teams. Yeah. Absolutely. And then when they read that article, they realized that's what a product team is. Yeah. We're not a product team here. <laughs> and so then that, that really caused them to ask the right questions, which were, well, how do we become a product team? A gente está caminhando quase para o fim do episódio e antes da pergunta que a gente sempre faz aos nossos convidados, eu ofereci o meu lugar de host desse podcast para o Kagan e perguntei quais empresas ele vê como referência em produto que ele convidaria PMs para serem entrevistados aqui no Produto Pelo Mundo. Well, this is the good news is there are quite a few of them around the world. Um, I've met many of them around the world. And it's not just in San Francisco at all anymore. It's all over the world. Um, of course, most of them, nobody knows who they are because they're a smaller company. The names that you would recognize, of course, Amazon is one of the absolute best. Netflix is absolutely fabulous. Uh, Spotify is excellent. Uh, Also, I just, if I think of a place in the world, I can think of in, in London, there's a fabulous company named Trainline that it completely transformed. Uh, it's where you basically buy uh, train tickets. Um, actually, Jim Pass in, the, uh, in Brazil, based in Brazil, I've met their team, quite a very good team. This is, you know, they're, they're really everywhere. Slack, Airbnb, these are great companies. Google has many, they're almost like a hundred companies, but they have very good general culture on these things. Um, yeah, I mean, all over. Awesome. Some of the best companies in the world are in China now, in India now, in every space. Legal. Agora sim, como a gente sempre faz aqui no Produto Pelo Mundo, a gente pediu para o Kagan recomendar algum livro que ele tenha gostado recentemente. Yes, uh, I, I like you. I like books a lot. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, I do read a lot of books. You know, most books are not really worth reading, but you have to read a lot to find the ones you like. Uh, but there are some wonderful books out there. Probably my favorite author in technology is a guy named Ben Horowitz. Yeah. And Ben wrote, of course, a famous book a few years ago 
called the hard thing about hard things, which most people have heard of in their, in this industry. And to me, it's required reading for any product person, but just recently Ben published a, a new book, which is called what you do is who you are. And it's a book about culture. It's very much about the topics we are talking about, but it's about like, what's the right culture. And Ben took a very unusual way of, um, of talking about this. It's not the normal. He doesn't just talk about Uber and what a bad culture it is and things like that. He talks about history and he talks about amazing examples of culture and leadership from places you would never expect, like the U.S. prison system. And just, it's a, a very inspiring book. Ben is one of the smartest people I've ever met. And uh, I, I hope he continues to write books. But uh, for those who haven't, because it's a new book, and I'm not even sure if it's out in Portuguese yet, but uh, as soon as it comes out, it's worth reading. Boa. É a segunda vez que o Ben é recomendado aqui no podcast. E o link para quem quiser comprar o livro está aqui na descrição. Keigan, muito obrigado por essa conversa. Tenho certeza que a comunidade brasileira de produto vai gostar bastante. Thank you for having me. A gente está bem feliz de ter conseguido criar esse conteúdo para vocês. Eu espero que seja bem útil para todo mundo. Antes de fechar, algumas pessoas perguntaram se a gente pretende chamar brasileiros que estão desenvolvendo produtos aqui no Brasil também. A resposta é que a gente pode sim fazer isso em algum episódio bônus como esse. Mas não é o principal foco do podcast. Até porque existem outros podcasts que são muito bons de produto que já fazem isso muito bem. Então fica aqui o reforço para o podcast Mulheres de Produto, que já tem mais de 30 episódios, e também para o Product Backstage do Spengler, que se você não conhece, vale muito a pena, tem muito conteúdo bom. A gente vai ficando por aqui com esse episódio especial de Produto Pelo Mundo. Se você gostou do conteúdo, compartilha nas suas redes, que já ajuda bastante. Esse podcast foi uma produção da Mnemônica, com edição de Pedro Moleiro. Eu sou Guilherme Seabra e a gente se encontra no próximo episódio. Até! Até!